before we start, I would like to ask you all a question. Who do you consider to be successful? Take a second, write down a name or two. Several weeks ago, I asked the same question to some of my peers, and their answers were diverse. One said she finds people who don't compare themselves to others to be successful, and another one said people who find enjoyment in what they're doing, like Mr. Baker, a feared but beloved calculus teacher at our school. Thus, the definition of success varies from person to person. When I ask you this question, what were some of the names that came into your head? Some of these names could include Steve Jobs, Oprah Winfrey, Mary Shelley, Yuna Kim, or someone else who is close to you. Why do you consider them to be successful? Whomever you thought of, each of our answers shares one thing in common. They are not known for nothing. Whether for founding a world-leading telecommunications company, hosting a high-rated television show, leading the romantic movement as a novelist, or becoming the first female all-podium figure skater in the Olympics, they are known for something. Being considered successful depends on the fulfillment of one's desire or potential rather than on a predetermined scale or category like money, status, or power. So how do we become successful? We achieve through our actions, though sometimes we miss our chance because we would hesitate due to fear of regret, which is a powerful incentive to maintain the status quo in our lives according to psychologist Neil Winter. Frankly speaking, overcoming the fear of regret is difficult. I'm sure that every one of us has regretted something we have done as well as something we have not done. The consequences may differ, but many psychologists, including Melanie Greenberg, agree that in the short term, we are more likely to regret actions we have made. However, over a long term, we are more likely to regret actions not taken. Let's take a look at some real-life consequences. An article produced by Forrest in 2012 organized 25 biggest regrets people have reported to have experienced in their lives. I scanned the list and chose some things that I could definitely relate with, and I suspect you might also. Take some time to read these. What commonalities do you see that they share? Many of them begin with not, which indicates that many people regret not doing something because regret comes easily to people who feel like they have failed to live up to their ideal selves. When we do not do something, according to research published by Thomas Gilovich, Victoria Medvek, and Serena Chen, our mind continues to go back to the situation and imagines what could have happened. They explain that we tend to get stuck on the infinite possibilities of what could have happened, rather than on the finite possibilities of what did happen. Neil Rose and Amy Somerville use an example that I'll adapt here. Imagine, there is a person right in front of you, and that person is gorgeous. So you want to be friends with him or her. Now, what would you do? Many of us would hesitate to approach him or her because of the fear of potential rejection. However, if we miss our chance to ask him or her out, our boundless imagination invents scenarios like, that person seemed nice to me so he or she might have accepted me. Ah, we would have been wonderful partners. Therefore. It is important to try new things and step out of your comfort zone because we regret more when we don't. But really, if I were to say, just do it like Nike, there's no meaning to it because if it were so easy to change, why wouldn't people 
Just do it. So, what blocks us from choosing action? I think this happens because, as I observe in my relationships and within myself, fear of regret is closely linked with fear of failure. How we confront failure is important. It is said that where the mind goes, our energy flows. And so, the fear of failure would result from perceived potential humiliation or embarrassment. When do we feel humiliated? Humiliation or shame occurs when the society perceives us in a way that we don't want to be perceived. Feeling humiliated can be a heartbreaking moment. So prior to taking an action, we need to first consider if the action can realistically happen and if the potential outcome would break us. What do I mean by that? Let me share an example, in fact, my story. Three years ago, I went to a summer camp where there were students from all around the world. Walking down a hallway, a particular someone caught my attention, and I was intrigued. However, I couldn't do anything at first. It felt just so difficult to approach somebody who I was interested in. I had a strong desire in my heart to just go to him and introduce myself. After a week, I wouldn't be able to see him again, probably for the rest of my life. So this was my only and best chance. Even though I knew that, I was frozen by fear. What if his friends see me and tease me? What if he says he doesn't want to be friends with me? What if? What if? All the waters filled my head and I could hardly function whenever he was around me. So I analyzed what could possibly happen to me if I were to approach him. I wasn't really aware of what I was doing back then, but now to think about it, I realized that I had gone through a certain process. I'd like to organize this to seven steps that I believe it will be helpful for you whenever you confront a similar situation. First, think about the best and worst case scenario for both action and inaction. Consider that there are a myriad of possible scenarios that could happen, but try to think of the best and worst ones. These will give you an idea of what you wish to happen and what makes you feel hesitant. So for my situation, the best case scenario was that we would become friends, or maybe more than friends, who knows. And the worst case scenario was getting rejected and being teased by almost everybody at the camp. If I didn't act, the best thing that could happen was ending time at camp without any heartbreaks. But the worst thing that could happen was regretting not saying anything to him for the rest of my life, or at least for the rest of the summer. Second, label each scenario and identify the consequences that may ensue. Would one make you feel satisfied, uncomfortable, or results can be more specific, like the loss of a job? So basically, summarize future outcomes and implications. So I had two labels, embarrassment and regret. Third, assign a weight or value for each possibility. Ask yourself, which one is more important to me? Do I care more about not being embarrassed? Or do I care more about losing this chance? Something to keep in mind is that what you may think at the moment won't necessarily be the same way you think about it in the future. Therefore, try to ask yourself these questions as if you're recalling from the future. This is by no means easy. Fourth, make a decision, action or inaction, according to the values determined from the previous step. Fifth, try to imagine you encountering the worst case scenario after pursuing your decision. Also try to imagine you encountering the best case scenario after not pursuing your decision. Sixth, ask yourself, do I still feel the same way about my decision? If yes, proceed. But if not, maybe reconsider. Between embarrassment and regret, which one did I care about more? He didn't even know who I was, so there was a high risk 
that the worst case scenario could happen. And I imagined it happening. I also imagined feeling safe after not approaching to him. No risk, no reward. I imagined both happening over and over again. But then I realized that I couldn't stop myself from thinking about it. Plus, a feeling of safety wasn't what I wanted to take from this camp. So I told myself that life is an adventure. I wrote him a letter and gave it to him directly into his hands. It was our first time to even encounter each other. And I wrote that I liked him. <laughs> if you were in the same situation, some of you wouldn't dare to do what I did because you might weigh embarrassment over building a new relationship. Looking back, I think I was crazy. Where did I get the courage to do that? I think the idea of the last opportunity finally encouraged me to commit it. And yes, almost served at the camp. At least a lot of his friends somehow found out. So whenever I passed by, I could feel their gazes, which was extremely embarrassing and is still embarrassing to talk about this publicly. Besides all the attentions I got from this experience, we eventually became friends, and I actually stayed in touch with him for more than a year. I don't regret my choice, and I'm positive that I would have regretted if I didn't talk to him. Thinking of it now, he could have been impressed by my confidence, which then was a byproduct of my choice of action. One thing that I realized was that when you opt for action, you earn something, some sort of result. It's actual success or a precious lesson. A piece of wisdom I gained from this experience was that humiliation doesn't last as long as regret. This is not to say that the scale of humiliation would be the same in other cases, and some of us might get seriously humiliated and go through a difficult time. When you do get ashamed, humiliated, or embarrassed. These are some suggestions by leading psychologists like Robert Enright. First, think that you're joining the club of humiliation. It's not an actual club, but it's an idea that people like Socrates, Jesus, or Ansan Suki, these icons are also the member of the club of humiliation. Thinking that we share a commonality with such amazing people helps us get in touch with our humanity and get a grip on our shame. Second, forgive those who have persecuted you. Show that you are strong, that you're not the victim. Take Monica Lewinsky, for example. You don't have to agree or disagree with the cause of her being thrust to the public critique to realize that she is an excellent example of overcoming serious humiliation. She has been targeted as the patient zero of our current culture of humiliation. After the infamous scandal of 1998, she couldn't continue her normal life and was so deeply embarrassed that she couldn't conceive of continuing to live. In 2014, she expressed her profound regret on, in her essay published by Vanity Fair. And a year later, she staged an even more magnificent comeback through a TED talk addressing the price of shame. Since her return, she has been actively advocating against cyberbullying and online harassment, successfully showing to the world that she is strong, that she can stand up again. When we go for action, we may fail, and it's true that we can be humiliated. Lewinsky's story teaches us that we can recover from our past pain and resume our lives with a new and significant sense of purpose. As Oprah Winfrey once said, turn your wounds into wisdom. If life is a basketball game, you have a ball in your hand right now. Close your eyes and imagine that there is a hoop right in front of you. Embrace your freedom. You have to choose your next action, either to shoot or pass to your teammate. In life, there are moments when we need to decide either to take an action or not to take it. We call this pivotal moments because the choice we make will impact the consequences that follows. As Wayne Gretzky said, you miss 100% of the shots you don't take.
Now, what if I ask you about your plans for the rest of the day or week? Would your schedule involve activities or actions that you wanted to commit but have been shelving until now? It's a beautiful Saturday and you're already off to a great start by attending this conference. You found something that interests you, an experience that you can have and we can share. One that will give you an opportunity to challenge yourself in interesting ways. Imagine a world in which we all led a life that is full of becoming and overcoming. The hoop is right there, so let's take the shot.